I think it's time for a quick update on Project JU, mainly the grid concept. Hmm. Well, roll the intro. Come with real, it's the next episode. So you would have seen in the previous episode a sneak peek of the design that we have of the current grid. But for us to appreciate how we got there, let's talk about the design iterations from the brainstorming idea that we had, your comments that you've given into the channel, and how these were implemented through the CAD to give us what we have today. So if we go back to the original idea of the grid concept, it was a very basic box that held an array of 18650s and the means of connecting to those batteries are used a cheap and cheerful M4 button head screws both on the lid as well as on the base. Now that obviously brought about a lot of comments about the lack of flexibility of these uh, terminals and there was sort of a lot of suggestions about I should use a spring terminal which is a very good idea. So when I looked on eBay here in the UK I found there were 50 that you can get for around £4, which is quite cost effective, and I ordered some. But when I looked at the design in more detail, it seemed that it was going to be a hassle trying to get this model to print right on the 3D printers, as well as provide very secure connection uh, and assembly to those terminals. And I felt there was still a much simpler solution than using something so fiddly. That was actually a comment that came from Buckaroo's T. Now, Maura Fermi recommended that we look at pogo pins. Well, I found some information about pogo pins on eBay. I couldn't believe that they're £2.67 each, and we need 60 so we've already blown the budget. So clearly, that is not the way that we want to go. Good idea on a high-end product. But not the way to go. But Augustino also recognized that we need a, an, a, a better method to connect to the 18650. But Augustino recommended we use springs on the positive side uh, and not on the negative side on the lid, which I felt can give some misinterpretation to people inserting these batteries because we all know when you see a spring in a battery compartment that's where the negative side of the battery goes so i was too comfortable about using that idea but what Agostino did highlight was the fact that the lid to this contraption needed to be locked in place and secured to provide a very solid uh, connection whichever method that we use and what Agostino recommended was to use a set of rare earth magnets which are strategically positioned on the lid. Now that kind of sparked an idea about using rare earth magnets, uh, but not in that manner. Why not use rare earth magnets as a terminal itself? Now bear with me here while I explain the idea. So when I looked on eBay for rare earth magnets, uh, they're fairly cost effective. Uh, you can pick up 100 pieces for £6.39. I think that's not too bad. Um, but then I, I was looking around and I found that there was also a one with a hole that had a countersunk hole on the surface. So that gave me an idea to use these countersunk magnet uh, neodymium magnets and basically put them in the negative tray, uh, insert a screw through that which uh, is free to run through the magnet if it needs to, it's not fixed in a permanent way but obviously being a steel screw it will magnetically connect with the magnet. Fix a nut a certain distance away from the bottom of the tray so that the screw itself is free to move up and down. We don't need much of a distance, two to three millimeters is more than enough. Use a wire washer which has a, a crimped section on one end and a through hole the other so that the screw can go through that and then lock that in place uh, with the two nuts so that these two nuts are now locked together so when continuously removing batteries those nuts won't work themselves free. So it now what we've got is a very sexy design, has magnets in it, will provide 100% good contact with the screw, with the battery, but also will lock the lid in place when magnets are on the lid side as well. 
So I think we've killed two birds with one solution, which is always great. So moving swiftly on, some of the other comments that were coming in was regarding airflow or what happens when the battery gets warm. Also batteries that have still gunk on them and sticky tape, uh, should we not allow more space for them like square holes? Temperature sensors, what about dying cells as well when they get too hot? These are all very valid comments. Those comments led me to change the grid design to more of a kind of a skeletal design. So I experimented with not having a box, but just having a pure skeletal design. Uh, you can see that we've still retained holes at the bottom where we can use the magnet still and the screws and have that principle going ahead. Now we've also included uh, 50 mil fans. Uh, we've got three at the front, two at the back, which when, when I designed this, I thought that could work quite well. But the main thing was I thought the fans were overkill. So let's look at what happens if a battery gets hot. If a battery gets above 60 degrees Celsius, clearly there's no point going on with the test because we know it's going to overheat. So that temperature will conduct its way down the, the bottom screw here, uh, which is where you'll have an 18B20 sensor fixed to the actual terminal. And as soon as we notice that the temperature rises above 60, that test is finished. That, that battery is dead, it moves on to the next cell. So there will, would be no reason to keep the battery's temperature controlled. So the design then changed to a more staggered system so that we could best use the space that we have. The battery count has gone down from 60 to 25, but I feel that it's 25 to 30 cells that you'll be able to process in a 12 hour period anyway. So 60 would be too much in my opinion and 30 is about right when processing five to six cells in a row. The lid as it comes down, would close above this but the whole area above will be open so if there is a battery that is getting warm just from discharging or recharging but it's not going to go above 60 we can maintain that temperature but if there is a battery that is looking to go above 60 because it uh, has a high internal resistance, that test is finished and that battery is dead and it moves on to the next cell, which is here, and so on. So we don't really need to be so anal about temperature control on the battery. We just need to monitor it and have a flag and switch that test off and move on to the next one. The other thing, obviously, was batteries with gunk on it, silicon and bits of tape. Well, that's easy enough. We just make these holes a bit bigger. I've allowed uh, four mil extra around the diameter, which is gonna be plenty enough for the battery to fit in there without uh, getting stuck in there. It's another comment that someone left and I, I couldn't find it so forgive me whoever made that comment but it was a very good point. Um, so we know that the batteries are tested per row, the rows are independent of each other. But the question was what happens if a row has finished its complete cycle? Another one is halfway through. Do we have to wait for all of the rows to finish before we can lift the lid? And basically what they were suggesting was that the lids for each row should be independent as well. That is a bloody good idea. Going back to the drawing board, uh, I wanted to simplify the design because we're trying to create a working prototype. So we don't need a complicated 5x5 or 5x6 to prove this concept. So I created a cut down version, uh, more of a 2x5, because really what we're trying to prove here is can we process the cells per row independently and, and, and once we can, then there's no reason why we can't expand that to maybe five or six rows uh, across. But at this stage, it uh, is a strain on my uh, CAD machine as well as on my printer. It takes a lot longer to design things because um, the model can actually collapse uh, when it gets too complicated. Um, so let's keep it simple. So the first thing that you'll notice is I'm still using the staggered system to keep the package as compact as possible. If I bring back the lids, you've noticed that the lids open up on opposite ends. And really, this is just to keep the model as common as possible. And there's no need to make unnecessary changes or unique components when that same part on this side can be used on this part this side here with some minor modification. Okay, so the actual lid itself has some engineering. So if we go into the lid assembly itself, because I want to share some of the key design points on this lid, uh, as well as what I would like to see in the lid itself. So the first thing I want to look at is the actual, what I call the lid catch assembly. If I hide the actual case, we'll come back to that later. You can see that this design is a very straightforward plate. If I open up independently, you can see it better. 
So the part would be printed this way up and it's got a countersunk area here and a through hole to accept both the magnet and the screws and it's got a cutaway section here for any wiring and you can see how the whole thing is assembled nicely. We, we are still using the countersunk uh, neodymium magnets but this time they're fixed uh, firmly to this positive lid catch uh, plate. Uh, we're still using uh, the wiring crank method here but ideally what I'd like to see is a PCB there and it's a double-sided PCB that I'd like to see. Uh, that would both make the design more compact and being double-sided on the opposite side we can actually introduce uh, LEDs. So you can see here I've actually created uh, these circular sections here and this is later if we need to create opaque discs that we can pop in there and that would be our indicators to show how far those batteries are going regarding their uh, state of recycling and if the PCB ends at this point here then obviously it would have to be wired up so we need a, a connector there of some kind bring back the case and you can see that the case itself has room for that ribbon cable to come out and go down to the uh, electric gubbins box which is at the very bottom of this assembly. The lid has some additional design features. Uh, we've got a ergonomic access point here so you can lift the lid very easily. I, I know they're very minor things but sometimes the little things do help. I've also created a height uh, stop here uh, because if there was no batteries and this would be on a sloped angle I didn't want to see messy things like that so I like to see things nice and tidy so even if it had batteries or didn't have batteries the lids would stop level to each other. Uh, going back to the assembly I don't know if you guys noticed um, but there is actually no axle or rod in there uh, because I've designed that as part of the lid so if I make that one invisible uh, you can see that there is a sort of uh, slope and an indent there and if you go back to the, um, the lid case uh, there's a kind of a nipple uh, design as part of the model that basically uh, allows us to reduce our component count and we've designed it uh, so that's easier to assemble so it's a snap th snap fit uh, you take the lid, snap it in like so, push it in and it snaps in place and you've got yourself uh, a hinged mechanism. Uh, so we talked about the loom as well. The loom, uh, wiring loom for the top lid uh, would be guided through here, go down through a channel of the grid and pop out the bottom where it would then go into the box at the very bottom which is where all the electronics would be. Now that's kind of an area that we need to be careful with because if we are closing and opening this lid continuously, that can put a strain on the wires there. Which also means that if we go back and open this lid up fully 180 degrees, then obviously that wire would be strained. So I designed a natural stop on the actual, you can see here, um, it restrain, it stops itself from opening up any further. So the wire won't be so strained, it will come out here, something like that, go down here. So that was important to add that to the design. So such a simple component does have uh, quite a bit of uh, design elements to it. Right, so we talked about the lid. Let's bring in the other lid as well and carry on assembling this uh, now working prototype in the CAD machine. Uh, we've also got a negative tray assembly here at the bottom. Now if I open up that uh, independently. So we talked about this before, uh, we've got uh, screws uh, same countersunk uh, magnets with the countersunk screw. They're allowed to move freely. They're secured in place. This unfortunately would need to be wired together because it needs that element of flex of uh, movement and a wire would provide that flexibility and range of movement that we need. This carries on having the access for the wiring loom to go through and that would go into the electronics box that holds all the uh, magic stuff. We'll bring that up here. There we go. That's our ele electronics enclosure. So at, at this stage, uh, there's not much information I have about the electronics, and the so therefore it's hard for me to work out how big the box needs to be. So I've just given it a general size, general width and height and depth, and um, you can tell on this cut down version that it's not a very big box. Uh, but once we go with the full five by five or five by six. Uh, it will be quite a big box and once 
I figure out the layout or once I get more information about the layout of the components, I'm more likely that they're going to be 3D printed mounting features in here for the Arduinos and the TP4056s as well as any other components like relays that we may need. Um, and they will be part of this box. So keep yourself posted to this channel. I'm sure that there will be a whole episode on the box design itself. So there you go guys and girls, that's the end of our 3D presentation for this working prototype, my machine. I've still got to get the updates on the electronics so that we can work out the enclosure uh, for the electronics design and also how am I going to fix all these parts together, are they going to be glued, screwed or clipped together, that's something I'm still working out at this stage. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, of the update for the grid and you can see that the comments that have come through uh, they really helped how this design is evolving so you know keep those comments coming through uh, make sure you like this channel because it does help publicize it even more which means that we get more subscribers and more subscribers mean um, more input so it's not about me trying to push my subscriber base up it's more about trying to push uh, people to come to the channel and uh, give their two pence worth Thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next episode.